Good afternoon. Welcome to the International Spy Museum. Thank you so much, and thanks for your patience. For those of you who came a little bit early, I'm Amanda Olke. I'm Adult Education Director right here at the museum, and we are so delighted to have you with us for Codename Hexagon, Inside the Secret Satellite Program with Phil Pressel. Our speaker today was the project engineer in charge of the design of the formerly top secret Hexagon KH-9 spy satellite stereo cameras. The Hexagon satellite was an invaluable asset providing photographic intelligence information during the Cold War. Phil will share some of the photographs that the system took of Russian military assets and cities, Hexagon was one of America's best and most successful spy satellites. The program was declassified in 2011. He is not doing anything wrong. This is why Phil can talk about it. And Phil has written a book about this program. It's very technical, but you can find that on Amazon, and you can find this talk will be on YouTube, and you can find other talks that Phil has done, um, especially speaking around the technology artifacts that he worked on. After Phil's presentation, we'll have a few minutes for your questions. We have a standing mic right over there. So, without further ado, Phil Pressel. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Phil Pressel, but I'm not a spy. <laughs> Even though I did work for and with the CIA for most of my career, designing um, spy um, mostly optical instruments such as cameras, telescopes, and other, other optical uh, things to spy on our enemies. The, uh, the first slide that I have shows the names of several former uh, spy methods. During World War II, Vietnam, Korea, most of the spying other than by spies themselves was done by airplane photography and there were sorties from England by the British uh, Mustangs, the Spitfires, etc. Uh, the U-2 and the SR-71 which now uh, I worked for a company that was uh, contracted full-time for the CIA we did design the cameras that were on the U-2 and the SR-71. The last few, the Corona, Gambit, and Hexagon, were all spy satellites, meaning they orbited the Earth. And I will tell you how they did that. Um, Corona started in the Eisenhower administration. Hexagon started in 1971, was the first launch. Okay, so, okay, th th these first few pictures I'm going to gloss over because they're just pictures of the British uh, airplanes going out with the cameras that is shown on the right to take pictures of prior to D-Day. And um, I'm not going to spend much time on them. It's just to show you, uh, this is the damage that was done by the German uh, planes in the area of St. Paul's Church in London. Uh, another one from D-Day. Okay, now, uh, Hexagon, we started, we were given the program, those of us who designed it, in 1966 by the CIA and we worked with them for many years. They were outstanding people to work for, very intelligent, good managers, good scientists, and they, they gave us a hard time because they wanted a good product. And they did get a good product. I'm going to be talking about a little bit about how it worked, but its importance was key, and I will get into that a little bit more. Okay. So the vehicle, the orbiting vehicle, weighed 30,000 pounds. Um, and it, 
Let me show you this. Let's assume my fist is the Earth, and the Earth is rotating from west to east. Spy satellites rotate around the Earth in a north and south orbit. Those satellites are launched from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. All the ones launched in Florida are equatorial. So there's a big difference. If I'm taking pictures and going into a North Pole orbit, I will eventually get to see and photograph the entire landmass of the Earth, which is what we did. So you can see the satellite uh, imaging an area on, on, the, on the Earth there. Now, it was able to take close to 400 miles in, in width and 10 miles in the uh, flight direction so that um, we were able to view or Europe, for example, or Russia, China, etc., in a short number of orbits of the vehicle. This is a, now most of the photographs that I'm going to show you have resolution of the land items, which are like from a few thousand feet up in the air. The resolution, when the program was declassified in 2011, which happened to be on the 50th anniversary of the creation of the National Reconnaissance Office, which was not even known to exist. In that year, as part of that celebration, they released, and it's the only spy satellite program that has been declassified. That's why I can talk about it. But the, the resolution of the best pictures was released by the NRO and the CIA to be anywhere from two to three feet, meaning that chair, let's say it was two feet wide, I could see the outline of that chair from about 100 miles up in the air. That's incredible. I'm not allowed to show you those pictures because they're still classified. So the pictures I'm taking to you are not as good. But the actual facts are that two to three feet is incredible. But between you and me, I can just tell you we did a lot better. That's all I can tell you. OK. This is San, Francisco, San Diego Bay, just an overall picture. This is the, San Diego has the largest naval base in the United States. This is a picture of it from overhead. And I live in this block. I live in San Diego. We're just making a trip east. And uh, anyway, I live, this is a pier. There are three piers. This is a picture taken in 1982. And I live right in a building on that corner. Uh, it's been built up tremendously. Okay, this is a picture of Pyongyang in North Korea. Uh, unfortunately, I can't show you more details than that, but just an example. All right, this is the satellite itself. This device weighed, as I said, 30,000 pounds. The it, 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 uh, the flight direction was from, uh, the, the front was down here. At the back were solar panels. The, the large round can, if you can see my laser pointer, this large diameter is a huge can that carried the film. It carried film for not just one camera, but for two identical cameras. These are the cameras that I was responsible for the design of. 
And those cameras are shown, whoops. Those cameras are shown, the two black items. This is camera A, this is camera B. They are six feet long, two and a half feet in diameter. Each of those cameras was a big, big, like a big beer barrel. Each one weighed 600 pounds. I will show you uh, uh, some details of it very soon. So inside that can were two reels of film called the supply of the film. The film was six and a half inches wide, less than two thousandths of an inch thick, and each reel of film that supplied each camera had, you won't believe this, 30 miles of film. 30 miles. So it's a, this is included some black and white, alternating with several miles of, of uh, color film, black and white color, etc. And the film was fabricated by a company probably most of you have never heard of, Kodak. <laughs> okay, so the film came off the supply reels, went through the cameras, and uh, through the focal plane of the cameras, and and then once the pho photograph was taken, it went through the re-entry vehicles, that, the same re-entry vehicles that astronauts come back from orbit, and the same kind of things. We call these re-entry vehicles, each of them a bucket, a bucket of film. So they went through, the, the, the first, the closest one to me is the first, second, third, and fourth. When the first one was filled up with a quarter of the film, it was released into the atmosphere, the heat shield protected it, and then at about 50,000 feet, a giant pa parachute opened up and it floated down over the Pacific, not far from Hawaii, and there were always five KC-130 airplanes with uh, trapezes underneath them to catch the parachute. And whichever one of the five planes was the closest was the one that was chosen to, to catch it. They brought it to Hawaii, where it was, the film was immediately sent to the East Coast. The importance of this hexagon cannot be overstated. I will correct um, Amanda when she said this was one of the best spy satellites of America. It was and still is the best spy satellite ever made. And I will tell you why. It was the last spy satellite that used film, the Kodak film I just talked about. Today they're all digital. The digital, the film takes much, much better photographs than a gazillion pixels. But it has a major disadvantage, which is why they're not used again today. Now the generals at the Pentagon, and we still deal with them, wish they had the hexagon available, and I'll, I'll get, as I get into it, I'll tell you why, but uh, they're all digital now. The disadvantage of the film is that you have to go through some thousands of miles of film until the first and the second, third and fourth buckets are filled. So if there's a crisis, for example, in 1973, the Yom Kippur War in Israel and the Arabs, we took pictures of that. But they, in that case, it was an emergency, and the United States helped Israel by giving them some of those photographs. So they had to stop the photograph and resend the second or third bucket, I don't remember which one, 
back to Earth to be developed and, and provided. So the difficult part, the negative part about the hexagon was the fell. You had to wait. Today's digital photography is it's they take pictures and it's transmitted almost immediately. And I, I have to say that the, as far as I know, the digital cameras today are approaching the resolution that the film could take uh, because so many more advances have been made. They use larger optics, larger mirrors, better quality, etc. But the capabilities of the hexagon uh, were still unmatched, and it was and still is not only the best, but it is the most complicated satellite ever put in orbit, period. And the reason for that is it, was, it had so many moving parts. You had rotating cameras, rotating supply reels. You had shutters, focus mechanisms, hundreds of rollers onto which the, the, the film rode. And so, and all those had to be controlled. And uh, let me go a little further. So, the improve, we had the challenge from the CIA to improve the resolution to two feet or better. And it was better. And we were also required to design the system to take, to map the entire landmass of the Earth. And most importantly, to have high resolution pictures of, of military assets of the Soviet Union, Korea, North Korea, etc. Our enemies, meaning airfields, missile bases. I will show you a missile base shortly. And it was all done with two cameras because we had to do it in stereo. Stereo means three-dimensional. So we took a picture, and, and, and you have to have two cameras in order to get stereo. With stereo, you can measure height. So with photographs of missiles or airplanes you can, or buildings, you can figure out the height of them. And the height of missiles, of course, is very important to know. And so we return four capsules of film periodically. Extremely high reliability. We backed up most of our systems with redundancy. Um, we did not waste any film and security in the mushroom patch. What that means is the company that I worked for was called Perkin Elmer. Its name changed now, but when I was one of the first hired to be to work on this program, and we, when we won the contract from the CIA, we immediately had to hire new engineers and all kinds of talents. Well, this program was so highly classified beyond top secret that each person had to be investigated by the FBI, etc. And it took between four months and a year to do that process. So what do you do with the, these people while they're, they're, you can't tell them what they're going to be working on, first of all. And they don't, so they don't know that they're accepting a job or not and what they're going to do. So we put them in, a, in like a very large room with desks. Some of them were assigned work that was de declassified, sanitized, so they wouldn't really know what it was about. Some read books, newspapers, etc. cetera. And, and we call this room the mushroom patch because we kept them in the dark and fed, fed them a lot of crap. <laughs> okay. So, so the difficulty in this, uh, and, and I, I'm happy I was able to help solve some of these in the cameras. The cameras were, uh, the, the whole system was launched from Vandenberg, and it got severe vibration, shock, 
temperature changes and during launch. So how do you prevent all the optics, the lenses and the mirrors from moving during all those vibrations? and not change alignment or focus. Well, we, we found ways to do that, obviously, successfully. And if you took a picture of your child in the backyard running, you'd have to move the camera along with it in order not to get a blurry picture. So just imagine you have a rotating Earth a satellite that's going around the Earth. The cameras, which I showed you earlier, I'll show you them to you again, they both rotated. They rotated in opposite directions. And the reason for that is to compensate for momentum, because if they were both going the same direction, the whole vehicle would wobble. So the cameras themselves were rotating only during photography, when it was over friendly territory, it, we might not take pictures, although we did do that. We had targets in the United States, uh, which we focused on for the first bucket of film to verify, because we knew the target sizes and alignment, uh, to verify that it was still in alignment and in focus. And it was always that way. but. Um, so you have the rotating Earth, the rotating satellite, two cameras that are rotating, and film that is coming from the supply reel past the focal plane, both in rotation and linearly. So you have all those motions, and the electrical servo mechanisms, control engineers, we are to be our, were heroes because they were able to electronically um, synchronize the speed of the image in the cameras with the speed and position of the film perfectly. That's why we got such tremendous good photographs. The synchronization was almost perfect. And so we, we avoided blurry pictures. Okay. We, we had 90 missions. The first mission was in June of 1971. It only lasted for 52 days. So almost every week or so, a bucket of film came, came back. As we increased... Uh, reliability and success. Each launch, uh, when the first launch was, when the four buckets were done, the entire camera system was deliberately deorbited and destroyed into dust by going through the atmosphere and destroyed and fell into the Pacific because we didn't want anybody any Russians or anybody else to attack it or find it or bring it back. And it was so successful in 1971, 72, etc., that it was able to allow President Nixon to sign the first SALT Treaty, Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty. And it allowed President Reagan, when he was uh, the pre in his administration, he verbally has said, trust the Russians, but verify. How did they verify? By using these spy cameras. They verified what every, every enemy country was doing, where their assets were, uh, and in great detail. So it was extremely important. And, and as I say in the last one, we, did, we never had a failure, a serious failure. Um, so we were able to map the entire Earth and take detailed pictures of, of, 
I'll show you of what. Now, we developed technologies. Okay, we, we, in those days, in the 70s and 80s, we didn't have CAD, we, we had no microprocessors, no LEDs, none, very limited computer use. No, uh, and so, um, I'll show you what I used. Well, okay, we developed the following. We developed optical encoders, and these optical encoders, um, um, I, were the ones that commutated brushless DC motors, which we invented. Why did we have to invent brushless DC motors? Because DC motors create dust, they're, they're brushes, they create dust. You cannot have a, an optical system with any dirt. And they created electromagnetic interference. So brushless motors solve those problems. We developed mechanisms to control the film so it wouldn't wobble off the rollers, lift off or move in any direction. Um, and, um, um, and of course, Kodak came up with better and better film. Not the type of film that you would have bought in a camera store, totally different kinds of film, color and black and white. I didn't use the abacus, that's a joke. <laughs> But what I did use, a slide rule. I used a slide rule to design most of the stuff in the cameras. Stress, thermal analysis, everything. The slide rule was great. Okay. Then came popular uh, pocket calculators. Okay, this is a picture of, of me in front of, the, of, a, of a real launch, uh, of a real hexagon. I'm pointing to the area where the film was. Now, if you can see, you, you see this is one camera, the other camera is in back of it. You can see, you, you see that black circle? That is the entrance window through which the image of the Earth came through. It is actually a lens, it's an A-sphere. Okay, and the, 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 the two re-entry vehicles were the third and fourth, they were the ones I filled up with the film. Um, the two spheres underneath the, the, the camera, near where my right arm is pointing, there were two spheres that contained high pressure dry nitrogen. And the whole film path, the can of film, and the whole film path had to be pressurized with gas in order to prevent the emulsion and any water contents, humidity, in the film itself from evaporating. I mean, we only had to go to one and a half pounds per square inch, so it was very uh, minor, but uh, those tanks held 3,000 pounds per square inch of pressurized gas, enough to feed it for the whole mission. And the longest mission was 275 days, about three quarters of a year. Okay. Okay, those are the two cameras. A huge aluminum frame uh, held the cameras. If remember, each camera is 600 pounds, six feet long, 30 inches in diameter. If you notice, one camera, let's make believe this is a camera. So here's the horizontal. So one camera was tilted forward by 10 degrees to look forward, the other camera was looked 10 degrees aft. So now you have the capability of getting stereo photographs. And they were, so you had a 20 degree stereo angle. Okay, this whole thing weighed about 2,500 pounds by itself. Okay, this is the Perkinama made the camera system and the film path. The re-entry vehicles were made by McDonnell Douglas Company in St. Louis. Kodak made the film. And the Lockheed, it wasn't Lockheed Martin, it was Lockheed in Sunnyvale, California, was the 
other prime contractor who integrated all of those items that I just mentioned into the vehicle. This was done at Lockheed in Sunnyvale, California. The whole thing was raised up. I was there many times, and I did some analysis reporting and some work on inside that thing. When it was vertical, there was a scaffold around it, and one time I had to go climb the scaffold 50 feet up to do something to a bearing, or yeah. And I, so I laid down on a diving board, reached in and did what I had to do. And I had a technician on a ladder handing me tools. <laughs> and one of the tools was a C-clamp, which weighed about four or five pounds. And I forgot to tether it. And guess what? I dropped it. And it fell down to the bottom where the film supply would normally be. Luckily, there was no film supply can there. So we looked down. I saw it. So I told him, go bring me some lacing cord and a big magnet. And I went fishing. And I got it. And we hauled it up. So he hauled it, and I held my hands out. And I didn't. And we got it. And we decided never to tell anybody about it. <laughs> anyway, so that was at Lockheed. Okay, here you can see the two cameras. Down, down here you can see this camera aimed backwards. This aimed, this one aimed forward by ten degrees, and they were. You see that window, that that porthole there. There were two devices called star trackers. These were optical instruments that looked at the stars and, and very faint stars in order to aim this exactly at the right spot on Earth. Am I, how am I doing on time here? Okay. And those, uh, I happened to work on those, on the design of those uh, also. They were about this size. They eventually were used to develop a smaller star tracker that was used on the Hubble Space Telescope. And those were so good that they could aim this camera to a spot so accurately that if you had a rifle in New York, you could hit a tennis ball in San Francisco. That's how accurate those things were. Anyway, and there were two of them, one on, the, one on each side. All right. This was, that, this was the Star Tracker. I'm not going to spend any time on that. And the top, the hexagon is in the top. The two rockets built into the sides were solid fuel rockets. This is a Titan 3D. Eventually, it was sent up on a Titan 34D from Vandenberg Air Force Base. I'll skip ahead for a minute. We were scheduled to do 20 launches. We had 19 successful launches, meaning good photography launches, etc. Unfortunately, and I shiver when I say this, the 20th one did not work. What happened was it exploded 1,000 feet above the pad in California and blew up exactly three months after the Challenger explosion in Florida, which killed seven astronauts. It was awful. And that was our last mission. It, supposed, it was supposed to be our last mission. If that hadn't happened, I assume Perhaps the government would have ordered some more, but it, they, they, they did not. And they exploded, and, and there was a lot of research done. And the reason I mention it now is because those two side uh, solid fuel rockets were attached, and where the fuel was transmitted to the main rocket, there were rubber O-rings to seal those joints. They were not supposed to be used when the temperature was below 50 degrees Fahrenheit. 
and unfortunately something happened and the temperature was less, so they cracked somehow. That is the theory on the Challenger, and it leaked fuel, <coughs> blew up, and the same thing happened here in April 18th, 1986. And so the hexagon system provided vital information that kept peace in the world for 15 years. That's how important it was. And that's why, and the capability of mapping the entire Earth and focusing with high resolution on enemy military assets was tremendous. And it also took intelligence of economic assets. For example, in Russia, they often had floods, water planes, which affected their agriculture. And if they had trouble with agriculture, they had trouble with their economy. Well, this not only spied on military capabilities, but on economic capabilities. So it was extremely important. Okay. This is a picture of, the, of a shipyard in Leningrad. Again, the resolution, I can't give you better than that. Uh, we also take pictures of St. Louis. You see the the Bush Stadium there. The the arch bridge is at the bottom, the second from the bottom. Um, I have lots of pictures of of different cities. I have a great picture of Paris with the Eiffel Tower. This is a schematic drawing. To the right, you can see that big circle is the can, which was about six feet in diameter, and this this wide, that carried the two reels of film, each 30 miles. And it passed the film through that chute to two devices, which I won't spend much time on, called loopers. Loopers were storage devices that allowed a minimum of 120 feet of film to be taken right away. We were supposed to be able to take Stereo pictures, if you look straight down from above, from 100 miles up, straight down is Nader. We had to be able to take every 5, 10, 15, 20 degrees, plus or minus, until 30 degrees, excuse, excuse me, 60 degrees. So if you look straight down and move, go rotate 60 degrees to the left and 60 degrees, that's 120 degrees. Each degree was equivalent to an inch of film. So we could take 120 inches, which is 10 feet. We could have pictures. You have a photo album, but these were 10 feet long. Or we could have any, any size we wanted, depending on the resolution of the military base. We took smaller pictures because you, they were close-ups. So the photo interpreters, the PIs at the CIA and in our, in our place, we all had to change our instruments. They used to have light, light tables that, that were this wide and this long. They now needed light tables that were at least seven inches wide, 10 feet long, one here and one here with a stereoscope spanning both of them so that you could look through and see stereo. You could see height and measure it. So it was tremendous capability. Okay, so the loopers held enough film so that instantly we could take photographs of 120 feet, 120, yeah, 10 feet of, of, of film, which was depending on perigee and apogee. Perigee on this system was about 90, sometimes 85, but 90 miles, say 100 miles. Apogee was the furthest away it orbited in, in an elliptical orbit. It's about 150 miles. So from 100 miles from, from perigee, uh, the film speed at the focal plane was... You won't believe this. 
200 inches per second. So we could go from that wall to me, for example, the film, whoosh, like that. Extremely fast. And of course, at higher altitudes, it went slower. At, the, at perigee, at apogee, it went about a third of that speed, but still extremely fast. And the resolution and the speed of the film was dependent in all the equations that we developed to control the system to the velocity of the vehicle above the Earth divided by its height above whatever mountain or wherever it was. Okay, then it went through the, the, the buckets. Uh, let me move along. Uh, these are pictures of the two cameras. You can see the two angles. You can see the two spheres that held the nitrogen. Very complicated electronic boxes on either end. The tubes were made out of aluminum, all polished, shiny, to reflect heat. Various parts of the system were black so that optically it would absorb light or reflect it. The whole temperature control of the system was done passively. We didn't have heaters or coolers, but it was done by the thermal engineers who balanced the heat and the temperature of the entire system. Okay, this, is, this was my responsibility primarily. Um, and at the bottom you see the corrector plate right here, and that, that's the entrance lens. And so the light from Earth came through, hit a diagonal mirror at 45 degrees, sent it to the primary mirror, which was only 26 inches in diameter, made out of fused silica, four inches thick with hollowed out so that it was 80% light weighted. And then the image went through the lens group, which is shown on the left. And, and um, that's the lenses. There was also a filter later that we added for color film. And this line here is the focal plane. So this entire area here was called the platen. And it included so much equipment, it was, there wasn't any spare room electronics, motors, encoders, shutters, uh, cams, etc. Um, anyway, uh, the camera itself was an F3 60-inch focal length, if that means anything to you. That's what it was. Um, I'll take questions later, but there's a lot more to explain on this, but I don't have the time. And this is a picture of the film supply reel. It's just a, one big Campbell soup can, huge. And this is a film path. It's very complicated, many, many rollers. And um, I'm just going to dwell time on that. Uh, as I said before, the scan angle was plus or minus 60 degrees. Um, they were the key uh, instruments besides the camera was the looper and a device called a twister which allowed film to go by in rotation and linearly by the focal plane at those speeds. It was a ma major invention. This is a picture of the looper. I'm not going to dwell on that. It gets very complicated. This is a picture of the platinum with the with the device called the twister. Um, we did, when film went by uh, certain rollers, the rollers had holes in them, like at the bottom left, and air, uh, the dry nitrogen air, allowed the film, the Kodak film, to ride up and down that roller on a film of air, of nitrogen, and not rub and get destroyed and damaged. Okay. These are the four reentry vehicles. When, when the f first bucket was filled, uh, this, this up here in the upper left, that's a guillotine cutter. It cut the film. Before it cut it, the film was wound 
twice around the next bucket, and then the film was cut, and then the bucket was re-entered. This is a film uh, on a re-entry vehicle. Uh, that's what the film would look like. On you have one here, and but it doesn't have film on it. Anyway, that's okay. This is a container. A film? No, no, I. <laughs> I've been. I, I. I wrote a book about this whole system, which you can get on Amazon. But that's besides the point. I try. I've given this talk all over the country, and to the Air Force, to Royal Air Force in London, etc. And I've always wanted to show them a piece of film. Well, I've. I. It took me almost 15 years since the end of this, I finally got one from a person who I knew at, who I was worked at Kodak. I couldn't get a film from anybody else, including the CIA, the National Reconnaissance Office. It's, it's almost impossible to get. I had this contact. So I don't think you'll... <laughs> and the only... I got a small, two small pieces of film. This big. So this is temperature-controlled humidity that contained the camera and the film system that was sent in the only airplane that would carry it, the C-5A, the C-5, back from Hartford, Connecticut to Sunnyvale. And it was temperature controlled. The whole, our whole building was temperature controlled. We had, we, we worked for the, all these years, and I worked for many, my uh, whole career in this building on many, many other classified programs, which I can't talk about, and there were no windows. It was uh, armed guards and all that stuff, so. Okay, this is the catching plane. You see the trapeze underneath, and if, when the parachute opened, it would catch the top of the parachute, haul the bucket of film, which is at the bottom, in, and bring it to Hawaii. Unfortunately, one parachute on one bucket failed. It did not open. So the bucket of film, with a quarter of the film, fell into the Pacific, sank to 16,000 feet. The CIA wanted to get it back because at every launch or every re-entry, there were always Russian trawlers in the area taking pictures and, and looking to do what they wanted to do. So the CIA did not want the Russian trawlers to capture this somehow. So they hired our company and the Navy to recover it. The Navy happened to have a, a deep sea research vehicle called the Trieste. This is the Trieste II. The sphere underneath was able to go down much further than 16,000 feet. I'm not allowed to tell you how far, but far. There were three pilots. I met some of them. And so it was sent out to recover that sunken bucket. And it took three months for them to, not only not, they found it, but to rehearse and go through all the uh, exercises to be able to grab it, pick it up, bring it back, which they did. And, and the CIA told the crew of the ship that once it got to within uh, 50 feet of the surface, they wanted a black tarpaulin over the whole thing because they did not want... There were three support ships that supported this, a tugboat, a tug ship, and two others. They didn't want any sailors to know that they were capturing a spy satellite with film. And of course, all the, the Navy guys were really angry at, that they weren't told what, what they were after, but they were. And so they, they brought it to the surface, and unfortunately, they were, when it landed in the water, it, was, it had like a shock, a tremendous shock, which destroyed it. And by the time it got up, most of the film dropped off, and it was totally lost. But the CIA was happy, even though they 
were pretty sure they had really good, important pictures on there that nobody else got them, like, like the Russians. This is a, a picture of the reentry bucket on the, on 50, six, at 16,000 feet of the Pacific. That's the claw that recovered it. And this is the explosion that happened with the last one. I'll just show you. These, this is a submarine base in Russia. This is a Russian aircraft carrier. This is where the, uh, the camera system landed in Sunnyvale next to Lockheed. This is the missile base. You can see the, they're identified, the launch pads, uh, the Russian. So if I took a close-up of this, you could measure the height of those missiles or gantries, etc. And here's a picture of downtown Boston. Here's downtown Manhattan with the Twin Towers. This was before 9-11. This is a picture of one airplane uh, site in Russia. So the very first pictures I showed you were sorties by England during World War II and Vietnam, etc. They had many sorties of airplanes. But with a satellite, you go around a bunch of times around the Earth, and in one shot, you can count how many planes Russia owned, how many military planes they owned. You couldn't do that with airplanes. So this is important that the quantity of planes and tanks, et cetera, could easily be measured. And the last slide I'm going to show is we, I worked on a proposal to the government to be able to put the hexagon on the shuttle so that when it ran out of film, the shuttle could go up, grab it, bring it back, refuel it, put new film in it, and send it back up. And it turns out the shuttle the satellite was exactly 60 feet long, and the shuttle had two inches of clearance on either end. So it could have been done. The government did not do it, and then, so it was never it never happened. But I just thought it was interesting. And so I, I'll take any questions now, if anybody has any. That's that's. Thank you. We have a microphone right over there. If anybody has any questions, just so we'll capture it for YouTube. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. We got, I'll go first, I'm sure. Okay, go ahead. Just break the ice. Um, first, thank you very much. I mean, this is mind-blowing, and the work that you did, you know, on behalf of the nation is incredible, nation safety and security. Thank you. Um, I, you know, I, I probably am not qualified to ask any, <laughs> some of the detailed questions that really show the, the, the marvel of this thing. But at one level, how many times did it go around the Earth uh, per 24-hour period? It was the same as an equatorial orbit of, from Florida, 90 minutes to go around the Earth okay. in one shot. One, uh, 90 minutes is one or, was one orbit. So in a 24-hour period with the Earth turning, it would have uh, taken pictures of the entire Earth? Not quite, but almost. Almost. Got it. And then it just did that again and again and yes. again. And how long were the flights generally? Uh, the overall well, mission flight per? Well, the first and shortest one was 52 days. The longest was 275 right, days. And then the others were in the middle they, as, as time went by, over the 15 years, they got longer and longer and longer. Right. And then are they, they do still have the film, i.e. they, the CIA or somebody? You mean the film? Yes, the actual film. The film is being, was digitized and then buried in, a, in, in an area. Uh, where, where, but, where do but, you think that area <laughs> Uh, You're not going to tell I, I, uh, it's, uh, it's to several to thousand Christian. miles away from here. <laughs> so, yeah. I, I, but thank anyway, you. Uh, the film, was the pictures were digitized, so they, they, they now 
for those who are cleared for the to see them, they're available on on the computer. Wow. Well, thank you again very much. Magnificent. You're welcome. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, kind of a Hollywood question with the buckets coming down. I kept on thinking of Howard Hughes, the aviator, who was obsessed with the film. Toward the end of his life, Ice Station Zebra, he would watch the film every night. Did he have any financing? Did he, like, and also, I don't, I don't recall if the uh, Glomar Explorer and that ocean retrieval. If, right. Did he, was no, he? In? He was, Howard Hughes was responsible for recovering a Russian submarine way back, a long time ago, with, he built the Glomar Explorer ship that eventually captured this Russian uh, plane, uh, submarine, and he had nothing to do with Hexagon as far as I know. Uh, but uh, talk about money, I will, if you, if you were to ask me how much does this program cost the United States government, I'll have the answer for you. It, the cost included not only to my company, but to Lockheed and everybody else. And this was money, 1960s and 70s and a little early 80s money. So it wasn't today's money. It cost $3.2 billion for the whole system. So that doesn't sound like a lot today, but it was a lot of money. I don't know. OK. Thank you, sir. OK. All right. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, wonderful audience. Thank you.